Um, yeah, so the trip south was really good. A nice little quick break. Heard the Lenten service went really well. Um, I guess we had an issue with the live stream on the last, the end of it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, let's see. So anyway, that was a fun little trip. Um, we're back at it, uh, moving into Lent here. How did the soup supper go? Did that go okay? That usually goes quite well. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're doing a little bit different seating arrangement uh, to kind of make the owl work better, get equidistant from everybody so people at home can see. I see we don't have enough, so next week we'll add another table. Um, so go ahead and find the spot to land there, it's fine. We are now gonna get to the flood today in Genesis. Trying to think of uh, any other important current events. Uh, I don't know if it's too late to sign up for the auction, which is what? Uh, is that? Next Saturday. Is that this upcoming Saturday? No, no, a week from this Saturday. Yeah, so a week from this Saturday. I don't know if it's too late, but you have to sign up. So if you wanna to come to the auction, you have to sign up. That's important to know. Um, yeah, and then uh, we've got our really great little spring potluck coming up that uh, make sure you're focusing on. And um, yeah. Jonathan will be back on the 19th. He uh, was originally, he's going to be back for the auction um, on Saturday, but originally he was going to, anyway, we pushed it. He wasn't taking the full three weeks, but we uh, decided he should do that. So he's not coming back quite as soon as what originally was planned, but nonetheless, he's doing well, good sabbatical, good learnings, good rest, good Sabbath for him. And very excited about that and excited to have him back. Hi, Lisa. It worked great. We just need another table. We're just, we don't quite, we're fine today, but next week we'll do the same. Just add another one. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. Any other current events? Any other announcements? Questions? Um, yes. I could tell you about Bert Clark. Yes, please. Um, Sharon texted me that he could not leave the hospital until he could stand and walk. And she was hoping by this weekend that he could do that. She didn't say anything about where he might go. I got an update too. Oh, did you? Just this morning. He's oh, headed good. to Northwoods. Oh, oh good. Oh, great. So I'm he's just going to get back. Good. Evidently, he got well enough to where they could oh, good. move him. Good. They're good. still waiting on one biopsy test that they're a little nervous about. But yeah, so thank you. Yeah. John Daly is still soldiering on and struggling to get a little better and a little better. So what a deal. That well, the infection is gone. Which is yeah, good. the infection is gone, so that's huge. So, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, with that, let's say a prayer and launch into our study this morning. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit coming to us through your word. And uh, let us uh, grapple with this amazing story in Genesis. And um, we, we look for your spirits leading in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You got your Bibles open. We're around chapter 6, verse 18. Uh, is where we're going to pick up. I think we got through uh, the, all of this paragraph. But... We, even though it's hard to remember, two weeks ago when we uh, finished, so I'll give you a little review. When we finished, uh, we had, um, we talked about the ark and the building of the ark. We looked at that word ark and that that's the same word that the basket is of the basket that Moses was floated in. And then we looked at first Peter where it talks about baptism as 
a saving event kind of like the ark or the flood and the water and and the one thing um that i thought we might do ross can you see is there a green hymnal in that pile of stuff over there anywhere or is it just bibles it's okay if it if there isn't actually there's a green one by the aisle. there's a green one by the it's underneath the app <laughs> yeah that's it so um i should have I should have got this. Uh, I should have got this up on the screen for you, but I'll just read it for you. Um, in baptism, and we've got uh, actually um, uh, an adult baptism coming up, um, either late service Easter or after Easter. Um, sometimes we don't do this flood prayer um, when there's little babies because they're crying and it's a little lot longer. Um, but Luther wrote. Uh, prayer um, that's a part of the thanksgiving before a baptism and so i just thought it would be a great prayer to read as we now look at the flood so you know we do the, the lord be with you also with you let us give thanks to our god it is right to give him thanks and praise and then this is the prayer holy god mighty lord gracious father we give thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth by the gift of water, you nourish and sustain us in all things. By the waters of the flood, you condemned the wicked and saved those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea and out of slavery and the freedom and the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the bondage of sin and death and has opened the way to the joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit that those who are baptized here today may be given new life Wash away all the sins of those who are cleansed by this water and bring them forth as inheritors of your glorious kingdom. You'll be given praise and honor and worship through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. So that's uh, what sometimes referred to as Luther's flood prayer. He wrote it uh, for this purpose, and that's what... Uh, so, you know, Peter picks this up, Luther, we see water crossings, don't we, in the Bible, out of, I just watched, because uh, I was looking for a movie to watch on the flight home, um, wait, give me, not not now, but after class, like, what's good to get rid of the achy legs on the plane, I don't know, I have to figure it out, but anyway, so, um, I, I got a movie to watch, and I found this old, this rather recent uh it's called exodus gods and cake kings or something and it's the story of moses and christian bale i think is uh is the um is moses and it's it's interesting though that uh they have god in the burning bush but they have god in the form of a child and <laughs> it's really kind of bizarre it was really okay until then and i thought well, I don't find God speaking as a child, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. It just says God was in the burning bush and spoke to him, but that you get this human figure. And and it makes and the movie makes it very unclear if Moses is having a or you know, so it's it, it although not and yes and all this stuff. Anyway, they just can't let the text speak, you know. So um, but there was a water crossing. I think they kind of made it seem like a big tsunami or something and all the water went out and they crossed and then the water all came back you know first was a part of the water which is what the scriptures say happened because of course we gotta we gotta mess with the miraculous you know so um but anyway um you might enjoy watching it but i was struck again water like the flood white you know so water's always been a powerful symbol um in the bible and a powerful, not more than a symbol, a vehicle of God's work. And 
So think about that with your own baptism as you think about the flood and how Luther says, um, by the waters of the flood, you saved those whom you have chosen. Now, right there, you're gonna, I wanna tip you to something that's an issue in this narrative. Is Noah chosen because he's really great or because God chose him? What do we hear about Noah? You know, these are things that are important and actually we do hear. We heard if, now to review, um, we, oh, did I share my screen? Yes, okay, good. Um, uh, let's see. You can look at Genesis 6, verse 9. There it is, right there. Ver chapter 6, verse uh, 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And 9. These are the generations. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. So, is that why God did that? Uh, he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Righteous, blameless. Well, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. And he walked with God. And Noah had three sons. And what do we hear later, by the way, about Abram? How was he righteous? Was he because he's a really good person and he did all the law and commandments? No. no. He had faith. So it says here, Noah found favor. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation. Now, when I read this all the time in the past, I assumed, well, God chose him because he was a really good guy. He did all the right stuff. He wasn't disobedient. I don't, I'm not saying that's not true. But how are you righteous? And is there a conflict in scripture in this? And I don't think there is. You're righteous by faith. So I think Noah had faith and he was faithful to God. Um, Versus the rest of creation. And of course, you know, um, being blameless flows out of that because he had faith. He walked with God. So again, I just put that out there to color it a little bit because then when we read this last time, and so then we get to, um, come on. So was it not just because he was better than anybody else? <laughs> there you go, Doug. <laughs> or better than most. <laughs> He was willing to listen. He was willing to listen, or he did listen. Yeah. Uh, Audrey said, "Obey." Yeah. He was the only boat builder. He was the only <laughs> boat builder. That was the main reason. Our great Ross, practical, practical. You know, that's great. I love it. Notice what it says in verse eighteen. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons wise with you. So um, I'm going to bring the floodwaters to de destroy all flesh in which the breath of life under heaven, everything that is earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. Now. There's a lot of questions, and this is where I want to pick up today, and then we'll get reading into the actual plot. What covenant is this? <laughs> um, the word, there's some words in Hebrew for covenant. This is barith, barith, um, a covenant contract, and there's different covenants in the Old Testament. This is an interesting covenant. I, you know, people debate what this covenant is. But let's go back to the beginning of Genesis. Um, after the, the bad stuff that happened, you know, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Um, and so they were driven out of the garden, but there were there were condemnations and there were promises in this, what happened. And remember, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
Uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring, this is actually in the Hebrew, her seed or his seed or what. Um, so um, this should be, yeah, interesting. I'll put that between you and the woman in between your offspring and her offspring. So, um, so which covenant are we talking about here? We haven't really heard of a covenant yet, but now we hear God making a covenant in chapter six after all the stuff that's happening um all this bad stuff Cain and Abel and the, the giants and the Nephilim doing what they did and now all the violence remember we talked about that last time that the reason God floods the earth is because it was full of violence um but we get Noah finding favor within the eyes of the Lord and we like to say, so I just want to start off by reiterating is it because he had faith and was faithful, he listened? Is it because he was really good and obeyed and did all the right stuff? Both and the text is comfortable leaving that a little ambiguous at the moment. But establish a covenant is really important. Um God is making a commitment. So what is a covenant in the Old Testament? <clears throat> it is a contract, but it's more than a contract. It's a relationship. It's more than just a relationship. It's a promise. It's God committing God's self to something. So although there are treaties between kings and other lesser kings in the Old Testament. There's all kinds of those kinds of Susan tree, treaties, as they're called, or covenant. There's two main covenants in the Old Testament. And the Apostle Paul will talk about these in Galatians. And he uses the term Moses. <laughs> and so there's a little word there's a little word in Moses' covenant that isn't in this one. Did you, you know what it is? It's a really tiny little word. And it's not there in this one with Noah. Yeah, yeah that's right. The Moses covenant is if you do this, you will do well. If you don't, you won't. All will go well with you in the land. But if you don't, it will not. If you worship other gods, if you do this, etc., that's the law. There's no if here. He finds favor in God's eyes. Now, you can decide if he got he got that because of his righteousness or because of his faith. I think it's because of his faith, which God has always said reckons one as righteous. So he had faith. He was faithful. He found favor. And um, God makes a covenant. And it doesn't, and God doesn't say, if Noah, you continue to be really good. No, there, he, just, he makes a covenant. He makes a promise. No wonder that Martin Luther refers to this when he talks about baptism, because Martin Luther and many of the Christian our, our forefathers and mothers and the scriptures themselves talk about baptism as an event that happens to us and a promise that's given to us. And there isn't an if in there. God doesn't say, you know, you are sealed with the cross of Christ and marked with the Holy Spirit if you stay on the right path. Oh, well, that's Moses, not Jesus. So, you know, it's just, it's something for us to have. An, I want you to have a, an ear tuned to these kinds of questions and these kinds of sensibilities all right with that let's read i will establish my covenant a lot of people by the way sorry i will read eventually but a lot of people feel that this is the p source the priestly source when you think about things being woven together um, and that this upper part would be the yahweh source the j source the the p 
if it's written during the exile, long time after this, in the 500 BC, when they were um, in exile in Babylon, that's the theory. Uh, it is kind of interesting because what do you, what do the people need to know when they're in exile in Babylon? They need to know God made a covenant with us and he's going to stick with us. So uh, some people call the P source, the priestly source. I've often called that source the pastoral source. Because you think about, think about uh, what Isaiah, the, the second Isaiah, which is, I think, a prophet speaking during the exile. It starts out by saying in chapter 40, comfort, comfort, my people, says the Lord. So anyway, just that's for those of you who want to mess with that. But I think it doesn't matter. We've got this text as it is. And I think that's the way we, we read it and look at it. But sometimes it's helpful just to kind of pull out those little emphases here. So, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you and every living creature. Now, did, didn't we already read this? You see, let's, let me just do this and see. Anyway, I thought we already read. Maybe I already read. It's at the end of chapter six. It's at the end of chapter six. Uh, yeah, there we go. And of every living thing and of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark and keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female. Of the birds, according to the kinds and the animals, we read all this last week or two weeks ago. Two of every sort. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Yeah. So let's keep going. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for you have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Um, it just, if it sounds like you get these little re repeats, this is why a lot of people think there's a couple different traditions woven in. You decide. I'm not sure it matters much. And I won't talk about it again. Yeah. Yeah. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will rain, send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So again, all that the Lord had commanded him, Noah did all the Lord had commanded him. Um, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with them went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of the animals that are not clean and of the birds and everything that creeps on the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. And we kind of, like, we got some really good uh, flood Noah art jokes two weeks ago, if you remember. <laughs> um, and I know that if you, if you have questions about the numbers, go back to the beginning of last two weeks ago class. We deal with you know, why these people are so old and what it could mean. Um, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were open. Now, let's pause here. Remember how we were talking about how historians and you know, inquiring minds want to know, is this factual? Is there archaeological, not archaeological, geological proof that there was a worldwide flood? And I think the consensus of most geologists is that there wasn't a worldwide flood, like the whole globe was covered with water but that the world as these people know it was completely covered with water. Um, so this is the local versus whole global flood theory. 
because we want, and, and the part I like about this question and debate is that I believe that our faith is rooted in historical events. And I think it's somewhat problematic if we say that the flood was completely a made up myth type of thing, especially when we see that all religions pretty much have flood story, you know, going way back. Um, so that debate rages and goes on. I, I'm, I think the, the local flood people may have a, a one leg up, but, and one of the things that makes me think of, it wasn't just that it rained so much that it flooded, but what? Came from the ground. Came up from the ground. The fountains of the great deep, verse four, and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On, on the very same, but let me stop there and say, I think it's right though to say that this is so far back into prehistory that I don't think we can ever retrieve like we can the resurrection of Jesus or we can even the exodus of the people from Egypt. Um, this goes way back, but I think we can be confident that something happened. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I personally am not opposed to the whole earth being covered with water because it says the whole earth. But again, you could say, well, the whole earth as they knew it was covered. I've seen uh, estimations of what might have happened, an earthquake or, so, you know, people always try and come up with naturalistic explanations for the miracles of the Bible. Um, and so, like, if certain, the ocean might come rushing in if certain things, and it would cover up the whole, med you know, um, Middle East, uh, you know, depending on, you know, and they've done all these models and theories, and who knows? But again, I think it's important, well, the flood did happen, and there is evidence for that, evidently, geolo geologically, yeah. Am I on target, Bill? No. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, last summer when I was in New Hampshire, my son-in-law brought up a video from YouTube on the, the Great Flood. Yeah. And it was the whole Earth. Okay, it was making the point that it was the whole Earth. Yeah. 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 So again, this is this is you get people trying to make the case one way or the other. Yeah. From a Christian scientific standpoint, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in some of the various reasons to believe books. Yeah, the reasons to believe yeah. folks. What what is his name? Uh, well, you Ross is you Ross, but there's others that yeah. Ross Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got you know different disciplines. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We just came out with a new book that I'm just starting. It's fantastic. Yeah, cool. So. Yes, please, uh, Joyce and then Kim. Ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> Ugh, that scares me. So if God um, causes everything to die on earth, then we are no longer descendants of Adam and Eve. We are descendants of Noah. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, but Noah was a descendant of Adam and Eve. Oh. Would Noah and his family be considered the second Adam and Eve then? <laughs> I guess you could say that, but that the seed, remember in that promise where it says, you know, your offspring will with the devil, Noah's still in that line of Seth, I believe, um, is, is, I think, the, the line. Kim, you were jumping in. Um. There's uh, some very similar Babylonian blood stories too. And so I wonder if that would sort of back up the fact that there was some sort of event that happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially in the Middle East, in the Bab Babylonian, Assyrian, we see blood stories. So it, you know, it's like multiple witnesses that going way back into prehistory, something happened that's been passed on over generation over generation. And we have to remember these folks are seeing just what they can see from a very limited viewpoint. Right. They're not watching it on television all over. <laughs> yes, exactly. As far as they know, as far as they know, it was a whole earth flood. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it was or it wasn't, as far as they knew, you know, it was. Okay. 
Um, and is, the same is true. Hugh Ross does the same thing when it comes to you look at Genesis and then you lay that next to the best theory at this point as far as how the universe was born. And if you told the story from the Earth standpoint of what it'd be from Earth, then it brings the two together. I think that's the thing. Yeah. So Joyce, I don't know if that helps your good question, um, but Noah is definitely part of, part of Adam's line. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So then we can be convinced that we are descendants of Adam and Eve. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, you make me want to go to a, a, a passage here. Let's see. I think it's Luke 3, isn't it? Uh, no, Luke 1. Is it? Where is the genealogy in Luke? Is it right at the beginning? No. Where is the genealogy? Where's the way? Come on, Bill. Genealogy of Jesus Christ. Here we go. And Luke. So interestingly, the gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, have genealogy because they want to take Jesus and show that he is that seed. Same line. He's the seed. Matthew goes to Abraham and Sarah. Luke goes all the way back to Adam. Watch. The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam the son of God, but do we, and there's Noah, so, so the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, yeah, so there you go, so yeah, so it all makes the, the connection, yeah, great question, okay, let's keep rolling. Hey, Pastor Bill, uh, just a fun fact on the whole flood thing is that even the Native Americans have a flood story. Yes, and so that might lend credence to those who make the case that it was a worldwide flood, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, guess what? I don't think the actual narrative of Genesis is concerned about it. It's, there was a flood. And it wiped out all of humanity. That's as we know it at the time. Now, this goes way back, perhaps before Native America. And but although you can also make the case, well, the Native Americans came down from Alaska from that part of the, and so they brought that story with them of that localized flood, you know, <laughs> back in history. So yeah, I'm sure you know. And like I say, that it, I'm not. That's not my gift uh, part. Okay, were we at seventeen? I think, oh, 13, thank you. Uh, on this very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the Noah's wife and three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. And they, every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. What strikes you, what strikes you about this description? Him. It's, it's pure grace. Yeah. No, yes, and the Lord shut him in. Seems he must have come down to earth. God is very much an earthly. What remember Adam and Eve when the Lord heard the sound of them walking? What what they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the cool of the garden. God is right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they say there that no will walk. Yes, true. That's right. Noah walked with God, so it's like God is right there with him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so God's what? 
God's pain. Sure. When God has to. Yeah. And I, this is an important comment that Kim just made because one of the things I think this text wants us to see is the grief of God over what's happening. I think God, you get the sense that God is genuinely grieving. Like, man, this is not, this is, this is not, this pains me. You know, we we would go, oh, God knew all along this would happen. We we try and get into the, but we can't really get into the mind of God. Oh, yeah, we hear. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I think it that God was grieved that He created everything. You think, right? It's back in uh, chapter, either chapter six or chapter five, where the earth was full of violence. Verse six. Chapter six, verse five. The Lord saw the great man's wickedness on the earth would come. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, that his heart was filled with pain. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, right. quite yeah. 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 And we uh, man, oh man. You know, we, we talked about, what does that tell us about God? We, yeah, please, Debbie. Why <clears throat> does it repeat over and over and over the same? I mean, verse 7, it talk, talks about what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. It's like it says it three or four times. Maybe. <laughs> that was Linda. That was their style. What was their style? There's about two or three answers to that. The first answer is that's their style. It's especially true in Hebrew poetry. If you want to know what one line means, go to the line above. They they do it in pairs. They kind of read them. So there's some of that. One the other answer is oral tradition. They take oral tradition and put it into and so oral tradition you repeat, you know, sort of. the other answer is like this this source theory that I You've got the priestly writer and the Yahweh writer, that these are different, and then they get brought together at some later point, that they're bringing together to different traditions. And that's why there's so much repeating. And it just so happens in some of the verses, God is called out, and others Yahweh. And so then they go, oh, these are, you know, but it's a, it's a good guess. Yeah. Well, it's just like in the Testament, you know, or too, but you see, therefore, and then it goes on to tell you something, but you wonder what's it there for. So you got to go back and look. What the there? Yeah, the there is the is the bridge. Yeah, I re you make me remember my Hebrew uh, teacher, at the Jesuit school in Burke and the Jet Graduate Theological Union where I went to seminary. And there's a um, a little word in Hebrew, I think it's Vayi, but um, I, I, that's what jumps out at me. I could be completely wrong, but there's this little word which is oftentimes translated as therefore, which is like in uh, it happened that or, you know, <laughs> um, how do our, our I'm not saying the Bible is a fairy tale at this point, how, but how do we start our fairy tales? Once upon a time. Yes, there you go. Um, it's kind of has that flow that, and it happened that therefore, you know, but, the, but then also the therefore is really important because, you know, things happen in progression, reason. And so, okay, you've got this and then you've got this. Yeah. And it seems like in the Old Testament, a number of the books, uh, there's this repeating over and over. Notice that quite a bit. Where it'll say something and it just repeats it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, so not to go back to the source theory, but since you guys are picking up on, you know, 
Old Testament scholars have often wondered about that. And one way to explain it, and so it's not just Genesis that is J, P, and these other sources, but the whole five, first five books of the Bible. So they trace these different strands all the way through Exodus, so much about Leviticus, but Numbers and Deuteronomy, and, well, Deuteronomist, yeah. So you see this, they, they try and look at this, and, well, this is, and that's one they explain. Or they just said that, and then they say it again. But it's a bit different. Or in this paragraph, God is Elohim. In this paragraph, God is Yahweh. And so they 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 stipulate this could be one reason. In teaching, one of the things they tell you is that the pedagogy um, is got to say it at least three times. Yes. You got to introduce yep. it, reinforce it, and then you got to prove it. So, yes. So. Yeah. Right. You know, repetition is important in learning. And again, so that would be one way to explain part of it is that you have oral tradition where you're repeating things, and then that gets brought into written tradition, and so they preserve that. Kim? To, it's kind of like the perspective of the Right. So if you've got Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Faithfulness of God. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's what really captivated me, I think. So I was first exposed to this more modern scholarship way of looking at the Pentateuch is that I like that it, it, it ferreted out the theological emphases and helped you see that. I don't think you need the source theory to do that, but it does help. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you think about the historical situation, of the priestly source being an exile. You go, oh, that makes so much sense. That's what the people would need to hear when they were in it. Yeah, yeah. All okay, right, well, we'll keep working with that whole dynamic. So that's really good. Where did we leave off? I forget. <laughs> 17. Thank you, Carrie. You are. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and we're going to get some more repeat. Waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed, increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land and though whose nostrils was the breath of life. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out of the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. I don't think you can tread water. <laughs> it, yeah, you get the sense again, but again, you could just say that from their perspective, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, evidently, humankind, except for Noah, was beyond redemption. You know, God could see there's no hope. For this, this, except for that, I, I see in this, you know, Noah found favor, and so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to preserve Noah and his family, but everybody else is going by the wayside. Uh, yeah, Bill. What about someone or several people probably had boats? Probably they didn't have what Noah had, which is 
to put away the food so you can make it through this whole flood. Right. They may have had a boat, but they didn't survive on Earth 50 days. Yeah. yeah, right. Right. Yeah. You you wouldn't survive this flood by just getting in a, your little thingy. <laughs> I think it said it had, but it, yeah, that's a good question. Did was the earth just cared for by the fountains and spring? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, didn't, I hadn't thought about that. Bad. Yeah, but everybody else, of course, you know, we we've, we've um, embellished this and thought about what everybody thought of Noah. What? Um. Does Jesus ever mention this flood? No. You remember? You're thinking maybe. All right. Well, let's let's do this. Let's uh, put the search over here so we can search around. I think Jesus does at some point talk about Noah. And we're going to go to the New Testament so we can zero in. Or how about Matthew through John? Guys, miss those notes? I didn't put a cap. Okay, that was the problem. Oh, look at this. Jesus is in the talking about when he's going to come again, the end of all things, when Christ returns. Uh, let's just take um, let's just take uh, this. For as we're in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware. Of the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man. You know, so you get this sense that the suddenness of it. I know some people see in this uh, stuff about the rapture, but um, uh, I think that's a, a big stretch. But nonetheless, Jesus does talk about that, doesn't he? Um, let's see. So just as the days of Noah, same way in Luke here. So Jesus no mentions Noah in this regard. Hey, you need to be ready. How do you get ready? Is the question. And, you know, that are you connected to Christ? Are you baptized? You know, are you a person of faith? Do you believe? Do you have a mustard seed of faith? <laughs> um, these are the things so that when he comes, because it's going to be a surprise, just like all those people that were making fun of Noah probably were surprised, you know, you you want to be in a place of readiness. So that's that's what Jesus in in Matthew and Luke does with the Noah story. So and that's that's probably helpful for us to know. Think about. It. Uh, in other words, do you have an ark? <laughs> Baptism. And who gives baptism? And where are you baptized into? You're baptized into Christ. And that is the mission of the church. Go, therefore, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've done. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. What is the church? Do you have an ark? The church is the ark. The church, now not to be the whole building, ain't going to save you from the flood. From that about the gathered ecclesia, the gathering of God's people, because you hear the word and you get faith in that way, and that is the ark ultimately is faith in Christ. But it's in Jesus and the ark too. Faith in Jesus is the ark, yes. But that's the precious treasure of the church. That's what the church has ultimately to give to people. Church struggles to believe that. There must be some other reason. We gotta make people. Uh, okay, good. 
How we doing? Questions, comments? Church is the faith, but the church also nourishes the faith. Yes. And so Noah has food and for God to nourish his family that survived. But the church has the food of the scripture, yes. the sacraments, and the fellowship with each other to nourish the faith and keep us going. And when things get a little tough, we can hang on to the hands of our friends in the church to pull us through because Satan's always there ready to weaken it. But the church maintains and gives the faith and surrounds us with the light. Amen. Bible study over. Let's go. <laughs> Beautiful. That's it. The church can give you that, but if you're not learning what the word is and believing what you're being taught, then it's kind of like the food can be set in front of you, but if you don't eat it. Sure. Um, and so coming here is a good example of that's right it's the food that keeps nourishing the faith so the church in our small catechism luther says that the uh, calls god the holy spirit calls gathers and enlightens us um and he does that through his word which is the ministry of the church the church is wherever the word is preached in the sacraments administered according to the scripture that's what makes the church the church the church is not present when you have bishops and a pope and cardinals and all this wonderful structure. That doesn't make the church present, according to our Lutheran tradition. You'll note that Lutherans have been all over the map and how they organize because it's not, it's our confession that unites us, not our structure, which is both of, in this world a plus and a minus. But um, yeah, what you have to have the church is the word being preached, creating, sustaining, nurturing faith. Uh, that's what the church's mission is. Um, and of course, it's going to do that with lots of problems and fallibilities um, because it's not Jesus, it points to Jesus. So it brings people to Jesus. So, yeah, but Jesus is the ultimate arch. Because what? What is it? Okay, here, here we go. Here we go. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, saying, this is my body. There's the food, the bread of heaven. And then this is my the cup of the new covenant, of the new, what? Covenant? God made a covenant with Noah. It had no if in it. So, um, and same with Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to bless you, et cetera. Um, Noah had faith that was reckoned, I mean, Abraham had faith that was reckoned him as righteousness. So Jesus is the new covenant um, that God's made, and he is the ultimate heart, because he's going to forgive our sin. He's going to make us righteous, because we're not. So, yeah. Okay, how are we doing? We're at chapter 8. We've got through a whole chapter. We must have skipped something important, I <laughs> I'm sure. Um, let's see. I think we did seven, right? Yeah. He used the fog today. He blotted out. So he shut Noah in, he blotted out um, the rest. Except for the fish. Exactly. I don't know about that a lot. That is a fish sir. Unless it became fresh water and the salt fish died and then the fresh meat died because the salt we are needing bread. Yes. Um but let's go more theologic here. What do you do with this God who will wipe out everything? Let's spend just a few minutes and then we'll get into chapter eight. Does this you fear him? Okay, so it so it does make you think God cares about righteousness. And, and if you don't 
Absolutely. I just noticed it's the, the thing that the owl is not focusing in on you. So God is serious about righteousness. Good. Um, and the Old Testament, you see the law. I mean, it's it's there. So if you don't obey the law, you're killed. Right. So um so obeying the law might even the wages of Paul says the wages of sin is what? <laughs> okay. Wages of sin is death. Um, I think you see the power of God. Okay. Good. Okay. So we see the righteousness of God. Righteousness matters to God. God is serious. It makes us have some, a healthy sense of fear. We call him, you know, God. And then we see how powerful. That God could flood and wipe out. But he can recreate. But then he also can recreate. Nice. Okay, good. So God is relentless in accomplishing his plan, which is salvation. Okay. Like the honor and satisfied with the first days he's making so he's very fresh again. Yeah, yeah. He is determined to shape life and creation into his God's design. And he's relentless in that. Okay, good. What else do we learn about God? I mean, some people might object to this God. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this was one of the things that I struggled with when we started. You know, I think the church, the church does a disservice to stories like this in Sunday school because we've got, you know, the Lord told Noah to build down the earthy archy, yeah. get the children out of the country. It's a sweet little story. Yeah. The story is kind of, we reduce it to this children's story. Right. And then as we get older, Without having, you know, our teaching, we reduce it to mythology. Right. Instead of, you know, really looking at theology of it, right. you know, what we're trying to do here. But, uh, you know, it's really easy to dismiss the story. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's an, it's just a story, you know, et cetera. Yeah. That's really, that's really interesting, Kim, because I think about the, the narrative of the scripture doesn't allow us to make God into a marriage. But we want to. Right. And an example of this is so many people I read it to who say, fuck the God in the Bible is this mean, horrible God. And I don't believe in a God like that. I'm not going to believe in that God. And I always that my, my typical reaction is to jump in and make a defense. But now, so you think God would be the way you think God would be. Just to reiterate, I just say it exactly what they're saying. So God should be like you think God should be. So that, yeah, Stephanie Rick, who's back in charge? Yeah, right. right. And what's an idol? We make God so we can manipulate God. So even that, because I have, I, but the thing is, I'm not saying that at all jumpy. It's the same question. They wrestle with the God of the place. And they do wrestle with the God that we believe in creation. But the flip side of it is that God is righteous. And God want, doesn't want violence in the land. He doesn't want God's creation to be done. And he created us to be in his image. And then we decided as human beings that we take his place. And when we say, I believe the God of the Bible because of such and such and such, we're saying, I'm going to be God. All of us. Is that 
kind of a little bit like today some people say i don't want i don't want that to be what god's word says i want it to say what i want this is very similar yeah yeah do we interpret scripture or does scripture interpret us of course we have them but we need to we we have hermeneutics and we do need to interpret and bridge the gaps of history and we do need to do that work, but obviously God's word is supposed to interpret us. You know, so I think you can make that case a little bit, more, and that's a tension. But yeah. So where does how can you also say, yeah, God is let's keep going, let's finish this. What do we learn about God? God is determined to be righteous. God righteousness matters, i.e., not violence. You know, e serving God's will and design, where people flourish and are not killing each other and murdering each other and stealing and all of this chaos that's come in. Where is there a graceful God in this? Well, God didn't block humanity. He did say, and this is where Luther, going back to where we started, says he focuses on God saved Luther. God saved Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve the whole by choosing Noah. He chose Noah and his family and saved them through the flood. Like the flood destroyed Noah. The flood saved them. So that's what Kim said about the grace of God. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He protected them. Yeah. He protected them. Yeah, he is abounding. It's, that's what the if somebody asks, I said, well, you got to read the whole Bible and the Hebrew scriptures. I, you know, I, I mean, I you know, I'm over my many years here, I constantly take every advantage and opportunity to correct the horrible misunderstanding of the Bible that the Old Testament God is just full of wrath, and the New Testament God is that's a heresy that was rejected in the church long ago. Um, because over and over it says God is chesed, full of loving kindness and mercy, etc. Um, so, well, as Lutherans, now I get to kind of bring this to the close. Lutherans believe that God speaks in two words in the Bible. Two words. That's it. Law and gospel. The flood story is law and gospel. Condemns the wicked. Cond you know, that is the law. God is, but gospel, there's an order. And he's saving the people. So God only speaks in these two words. And you need to know it is. Because if you don't have the gospel, then you are left with the God of wrath, etc. If you don't have the law, you just got a touchy-feely God that doesn't care about it. Is that it? Luther said, what? What did he say? If you don't know the difference between law and gospel, you will never understand the scriptures. I mean, yeah, please. Didn't God know that it was going to hurt? <laughs> you would think, but not one place do I see that the text goes there. You know, we as human beings, it's a, it, I've asked that question many times. Like, Lord, you had to have known this was going to happen. Was this all part of your plan? And we wrestled with that back uh, when we wrestled with the Adam and Eve's, you know, so-called fall or the, his, their rising. They're, they're trying to preempt God. Did God know that was going to happen? I guess if we start with the Greek notions of God, that God was all-knowing, all-powerful, all this, all that, then we'd have to say God did. But that's where, like, your ways are higher than my ways, and I I just don't know that we can ever, you know, know or grasp it. Yeah. And God saw that it was good. Or yeah. not. So say we, more. He did this thing. Yeah. He said after every day after age. Yeah, it was good. He didn't say it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. What? He had good intentions. Absolutely, God did. And so again, 
oh, God knew that this was the way it was going to happen. Maybe this was all part of God's plan. That's where, you know, God's ways are higher than man's ways. I think He knew it would happen, but it's up to man mm. to make the choice between their goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So He gave humanity freedom to, you know, move in one direction or the other. They're not robots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you remember, if you remember, we did a lot of work on this. <laughs> yeah. We must be testing his patience. Yeah. If the sun is out and we are out of here. Now, um, the flood is going to subside. And since we are kind of close to the end of our time, I feel a strong need to address some of what we heard this last part. Um, Let me ask this question, even at the end of the story yet, because we haven't even got to the rainbow and good stuff yet. Um, and the end of the flood. But does this work? Did, the, did God wiping out everybody and just keeping Noah work? <laughs> oh my goodness, Noah isn't so good. But maybe he wasn't. Didn't play favor with God just because he was perfectly obedient. Because he won't be obedient and he'll make some mess up. But God chose. God did choose him. And I think that's the emphasis. Again, I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> and when I read the scripture, the human tendency is to say, oh, yeah, it was the human being's choice and decision and obedience that God got. No, I don't think I'm And because he was faithful and had faith, but God was no. That's that's the main emphasis um, there. Um, but so it didn't work. So what does the flood mark? And this is good because this is what we can get into next week. I think the flood marks a movement of God to bring God's uh, use Kim's word, his relentless. To get his will done, not because he's controlling, but because he's loving and he wants life and life. What does Jesus come to say? I came that you might have life and what? That the good life, the God's life, that that kind of life. So God is relentless to do that, but now God's going to not do it by destroying it in a flood. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, there'll be some destroying, but now God is going to get God's decisive, relentless will done. Messed up human being. You know what happens right after the flood's over? People start building a thing. We get the tower. And then, so you would think God would say, okay. Second flood come out. Or anything. Yeah, exactly. But God, but God, yeah, we see that God produces rainbow, beautiful, right? There's a bow in ancient. God says, I'm not going to do it that way anymore. There's the bow. There's the rainbow. I'm going to start working in a different way. And so right after the tower and all of that, what has got, where do we start to get very quickly? Got my name, Abram. A woman named Sarah. She says, I'm going to bless the world through you guys. The flood marks a decisive movement of God that God is now going to get. God's will done through tangled up human beings and messed up, broken, messy, yucky, foul, 
warts on the toes and all. People. And this is not a God people want. People want God to come down and just do it. Because they don't realize that if God did that still, it would mean a flood after a flood after a flood. Was there a comment coming there, Mr. Cohen? Here in chapter 8, the Lord said in his heart, never again curse the ground because of man. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. Yeah. But today, man is destroying earth. Oh, yeah. God isn't doing it, but human beings. That's right. Message there somewhere. I, absolutely, there's a message there somewhere. And so the, we could conclude that, well, God evidently has said, no, well, forget it. I'm out of here. Or God is working for redemption in a different way than a flood. He doesn't say, I give up on human beings, but I'm not going to do it this way. And so, yeah, we, we still need to go back to Genesis 1 and go, we were made to be stewards of the earth and not destroyers of it. So, you know, we need to care. And then violence. So if you want to know my opinion about how to bring fix the world is you need to have people die with Christ in baptism and be raised to new life. And the, if we could get everybody more connected to that, I think it would affect all of our institutions, all of our power battles, all of our issues. But <laughs> that's a tall order. So anyway. Well, you keep thinking about that and wrestling with it. Great study today. We will jump back in at chapter eight. Rick got us started there, and um, we'll see how we'll, we'll race on through to God's covenant with Noah. We'll get back to that covenant and we'll talk about that. Okay. All right. Enjoy this beautiful sunshiny day. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Bye. I will. Pastor Bill, do you have time for a question?